Thank you. It is June 11, 2024. This is a regular meeting. It's 6, it's 632, a regular meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the pu public is possible, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. I am going to call the, the meeting to, I guess I just did call the meeting to order. Uh, let's see if everyone can be heard. I see Councillor Haneke. Present. Councillor DeAngelis. Present. Councillor Ette. Present. And Councillor Rooney, we are all present. We're, we're accounted for. Uh, there are no public hearings tonight. Um, and I'm just going to give a quick overview of the topics. We are going to start with um, nuisance bylaw and work on that for approximately an hour and hopefully finish that up. It doesn't look overly complicated. Um, and then we will move on to solar bylaw. So I was going to say to Dave Zomak, if you have other things you need to do, it looks like we have lots of staff coverage and, um, and I'm gonna see Christine's raised hand. So I just wanted to note that the agenda that was posted has the date of June 6th yes. instead of June 11th. And I thought that might cause some confusion. So perhaps someone should repost it. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. And I realized when I printed it out that it said 6, and I think it was because the date was 611. And Pam Rooney put the word June 6 in incorrectly. So we'll talk to her later. <laughs> so again, Dave, if you if you do need to leave, let us know. It looks like we have good coverage. I, I will be here, Pam. I may <clears throat> turn my camera off for a little bit and grab a bite to eat before you okay. uh, move over to Solar Bylaw. Okay, great. And I see Rob Moore as well. I'm going to um, take public comment at this time and uh, would ask that anyone who would like to speak uh, on matters pertaining within the jurisdiction of the CRC. Uh, you to use up to three minutes and um, the CRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during the public comment. And I'm looking in the attendees to see if we have none, uh, if anyone wants to speak. That makes short work of public comment Okay, great. Let's go to action item for a nuisance bylaw. As everyone knows, and I'm actually I'm looking at Mandy if you can manage the uh, the screen sharing. And I forgot to ask you that ahead of time, so I appreciate. Um, I can. I just have to pull up one that's not marked with my comments. So give me a second. Okay, we're looking for the one that is uh, coming back to us from the GOL that has KP law comments in it as well. And it's the 523-24 version, I believe. Yeah, it's in a, oh yeah, there we go. So we have, we had in our packet, we had the CRC version that went to GOL we had the GOL, oh, the, and then KP Law responded to that. Um, and GOL is now responding to KP Law. Uh, with comments. With it's comments. 4A. Yeah, yeah. No, it should be this one that I'm sharing now. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. That's right, correct. So what we have, and it's, it's Can you make it a little bigger, Mandy? That's good. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking, Pat. <clears throat> so the, I think what, what may be the easiest to do is to go through where there is a, uh, a highlight, such as in B1, 
and then we can quickly I have I have as a reference the KP law version of so there's their great comments and then what we have tonight in front of us is KP law and um, GOL uh, commentary and Pat you may you may be needed to guide us through some of those comments. Uh, or at uh, as well. Um, so the very first comment that someone had is under B1 gathering or event. And uh, I just want I just want to say that I I have people's pictures here so I can see, but I, I'm going to have a hard time seeing all the commentary and people's raised hands. So you might just need to speak out. So we're on gathering. Pardon me. We're on gathering. Yes, gathering a party or crowd or event, and someone stated that we might want to define a party or event. Frankly, I think that's not necessary. So because... I think. Go ahead. Sorry, I, I was going to say, I think what the attorney was getting at or whoever made this comment was getting at um, is a crowd three people. Does that constitute a gathering? Or does it have to be 20 or more? You know, um, is it two people? Um, what's an event? Um, I think that that's where the vagueness grounds challenged, avoid a challenge on vagueness grounds is. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, maybe we need to hear from Chief Ting on how he would interpret gathering, but I think that was that what they were going for was maybe you want to put a size to it. If I, uh, if I could jump in. Yeah, I'm going to call him. Yeah, go ahead, Chief. So I don't even know if a gathering in it of itself is even relevant um, because it, it, it could be one person, it could be two people that cause a public nuisance or a nuisance for it to be considered a nuisance house it doesn't have to specifically be a gathering. Um, you know, you could have one person at the, at the, at the house blaring uh, music that's disturbing the peace. And if we specify that there's a gathering, then that's no longer valid. Um, so I don't even think a gathering is necessarily relevant. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to that and just saying that our current bylaw describes a gathering and it means exactly this. It means a party, crowd, or event for a group of persons assemble for a social occasion or activity. Mm -hmm. And it's it's referred to a number of times in um, in the bylaw, so mm -hmm. it makes sense to me to keep it. Um, but I I totally agree that it's the disturbance that we're after, not the gathering itself. So I just looked at when we use the term. Besides the definition, we use it in section C. The two C two B, the specific events such as gatherings where alcohol is available to and are mm. consumed by underage purpose, but it's a such as gathering. So even removing that that term would probably not change the meaning of B, um, because it would then read specific events where alcohol is available to and are consumed by underage persons. And then mm. the other one is right below it in C activities that may not violate a specific bylaw, um, uh, but otherwise disturb enjoyment of property, including the following blocking of public ways due to gatherings. Mm -hmm. Those are the only two places we use the term in, in the current draft. I'll be honest with you. I, I feel comfortable with that because most of uh, the violations, most it's discretionary in terms of whoever the enforcement body is, and they would have to be able to articulate what the violations are, and to be able to to describe the events within itself. So I don't, I personally don't see it as a sticking point. 
if we were to eliminate it, you mean? Or to keep it, to be honest with you. Um, because, you know, if you were to issue a violation, uh, it would primarily be based on the violation in the acts versus a specific party or crowd. That's just to kind of illustrate uh, what type of gathering it is. Anybody feel uh, uncomfortable with with keeping it as it is, uh, Pat? I'm. I I hear you, Chief. Um, it seems to me that pretty much people kind of know what a gathering is and what the uh, lawyer is saying. What constitutes a party or a crowd? And that goes back to what Mandy said. Um, Right. So, you know, in any violation, we generate, if it's us, uh, and I can't speak for Rob Mora, uh, if it's us issuing that violation, that would accompany a report. And within mm -hmm. that report, it would specifically outline observations made from the officer that would include a description of uh, what that gathering was, if there was right. loud music, approximately how many people. So that would give a a, a, a pretty detailed description. Right. For, Anyone but it doing... also, I'm sorry, Chief. Oh, uh, no, go ahead. It also seems to me that it, you said it could be one person. Now, if there was per someone right. not even just playing music loud, but uh, yelling at people, you know, doing anything, just one person out there blocking traffic, getting, you know, having sort of a breakdown or something. Sure. Um, you would respond. We would respond. However, uh, you know, we want if it was a, just a single person, we might not necessarily apply a nuisance house violation. Right. Okay. You know, there we gotcha. we would have other options. Okay. So people want to leave this in or just remove the word gathering. All right. Pat? Not, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, if it's if it's if we're that ambivalent, I think leaving it in is not a bad thing as long as the okay. description by the the re, the enforcing party is is going to describe it anyway. Okay. So this is this is now author. Can you call yourself author uh, M? I don't know which author this is. We'll see if things change when I did it. This one was a blank comment, so I figured I'd just fill in the blank, but I will indicate CRC comment here. Great. Okay. Thank you. Keep it easy for yourself, <laughs> whatever you do. Okay. Let's, let's move along. Then. Um, the next, the next uh, element that was highlighted um, is I think I'm numbered num down on number seven. Um, I'd like to discuss two. Okay. Um, so, so there was a comment there that they resolved the definition that the attorney recommended we change. What we had in there was enforcement of this bylaw by criminal enforcement or non-criminal disposition. And the attorney recommended it be changed to this. Um, a violation of one or more sections of this bylaw. And I guess I just wanted to make sure that that doesn't change other parts of the bylaw, although the parts that we were dealing with how to define infraction and when we use it um, were also changed by the attorney. So we might end up doing stuff later. But, but we had struggled with... Um, it, we were trying to define infraction as actually like writing that ticket, right? Um, because the third ticket, we had this like tiered response of first response, second, first ticket, second ticket, third ticket. Um, and I don't know whether this definition changes it from three tickets to one event with three separate things they could cite as nuisances versus three separate tickets on three different dates. 
I'm I'm going to respond that I I think I recall our conversation was that it could be three tickets on one event at at one event, and I'm looking at Chief Ting as I say that. Um, that would be that would be you know in one fell swoop you kind of max out on your quota of of um, infractions if you will, and the and the owner and manager would get notified that you've maxed out. Does that re, does that ring a bell, Chief Ting? Um, so the way that we do it is is by instance. So let's say on Friday that there's a, a particular uh, gathering or party and we deem that it's a nuisance and we issue a violation, a citation for $300. And let's say within that instance, there's three different provisions that could violate it. So we would still count that as one. Oh, okay. Um, so it wouldn't be three separate tickets. It would be one instance. So then if they violate it again, the following day on Saturday, that would be strike number two. Okay. And so on. That's how we that's how we would do it. And I guess my question is, does the change in this wording still keep it two separate tickets? Or could the use of infraction later in the bylaw occur during come into play with just one ticket that had three different parts of the bylaw um you know you cite you know it, the gathering part but you also cite the disorderly conduct part and also the outdoor lighting part say you know <laughs> i'm trying to mean to pick random three random things um with how this is defined would that trigger the third strike immediately with this new definition Or because it's one ticket, it wouldn't. And that that's what I wanted to make sure we knew what we were changing here and how it affects the bylaw. I would assume it's three instances and not not like three violations in one. So if we said something like infraction and instance um, with one or more violations of this bylaw, one or more viol one or more violations of one or more sections of this bylaw. That's what it says now. Uh, well, an an instance with one or more violations. So I guess if we're going to keep it with this definition, do we even need the definition at all? Or could we just change all words of infraction to violation and eliminate a definition in that confusion? I'd be comfortable with that. So we just get rid of that altogether. And, and we, we don't need to, I don't think we need to define violation. I think that's, uh, right. I, I think that was my thing. If we're literally making infraction equal to violation, we can simplify it by just using violation instead of infraction. Okay. Let, can we strike a line to that? And then if we come against the word infraction elsewhere, we'll double check with this. We'll have to change all instances of infraction to violation as we come across them. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, B1, gathering B2, B7, we had a note on. Can you scroll down to B7? Public nuisance. Uh, response. Um, Seven was public nuisance. It's now six with the definition deletion yep. of information. <clears throat> right. A substantial disturbance of the enjoyment of private or public property. I don't know who made the comment um, from the GOL, but uh, private or enjoyment of private property 
or the quiet enjoyment of one's property is the standard term in mass general law. And I think that's what we're talking about. Are we on substantial disturbance? Yes. That comment? Yep. So apparently the town attorney asked us to right. clarify. The town attorney had some different definition completely of public nuisance. Yeah, but that was based on Boston and it had much more to do with criminal activity than, than what we're talking about. We're talking about disturbance. Does anybody disagree with that? The only comment I would have in regards to a substantial disturbance is how do you how do you determine what's a substantial no. disturbance? It's it, kind of ambiguous in uh, because one's piece is is going to be different from another in terms mm -hmm. of disturbing the piece. Um, and obviously, again, uh, if we were to issue a violation, we would have to justify and rationalize through our reports to describe exactly um, why it is a disturbance and uh, along with the uh, complainants um, complaint to factor that in. So that would be my only comment regarding that. Thank you. And I, I see Jennifer's hand is up. She's joined us. Yeah, so I should say I can, I can hear you. <laughs> um, no, I would ask, I guess, the chief, like, how would you define disturbances? I mean, could we put in the, when you're, when the police are called out, you know, what, would, how would you define or describe a disturbance? Well, uh, first of all, we would have to make a determination if there's a complainant, uh, because the, the disturbance will come in in different ways, whether it's, uh, if somebody calls it in or somebody witnesses it or is the officer witnessed um but certainly in in any event the officer who is reporting it would have to to describe articulable facts to support uh why that they believe it's a disturbance or isn't um so they would have to be very descriptive so i guess i'm thinking of the incident recently with the fraternity um on north pleasant and fearing I mean, that was clearly a disturbance when, I mean, wouldn't. So, well, if, if we're talking about um, the one, I'm not sure which one you're talking yeah. about. You there was a meeting that followed. Okay. You know, with the residents. So, well, the, con the concern there was, so that, that was a noise complaint. Right. And so for a noise complaint has to be in the presence of the police. It's a misdemeanor offense. And so when the police arrive, they have to make observations to see, you know, is there a gathering and they have to check their senses. Is there, you know, what's the noise level like? What's the cause of the noise? Where is that noise coming from? And if they determine, you know, the time of day, time of night, and the circumstances that it's unreasonable, then they can take some sort of action. When they take that action, they have to be able to articulate that by means of a report of why they decided that it was a violation. And of course, if that was to be appealed, uh, those facts and circumstances would come under scrutiny in terms of um, deciding if if the officer's perceptions were correct or not. Uh, so on that particular night, I recall there was a delay and that was one of the issues uh, because our officers were tied up and were unable to get to that noise complaint right away. Um, and I'm not quite sure by the time if they got there, if that noise was still a problem or not. You're, you're muted, Jennifer. I'm sorry. I guess what I'm saying is I think often when it gets to the point that a, a noise complaint is made, mm. it's pretty clear it's a disturbance. I mean, people don't. Uh, I, I guess that's what, you know, it's usually. That, that's not always the case. You know, I mean, noise complaints will vary across the board. You know, for example, a lot of times uh, if you're in an apartment complex, and somebody's walking too loudly in the apartment above, 
somebody will call it and consider that a noise complaint. Um, so in that instance, we can't really take any action on that because we would have to witness it, number one, and then number two, you know, how do you articulate the fact that somebody's walking too loudly? You know, that, that makes it, so there's a lot of gray area in terms of noise complaints. It could be a, a, a bevy of different things. Okay, I guess I'm thinking of parties mostly, but okay. Right, but um, let's go to let's go to um, Mandy Jo. So I I guess I kind of liked the Boston definition. I did too. Um, at least at particularly the, the unreasonable interference, which I think is, even though it mm -hmm. also seems vague, is actually more defined than substantial dis disturbance in my mind mm. um you know and it went an unreasonable interference with a right common to the general public such as a condition dangerous to health offensive to community moral standards or that otherwise threatens the general welfare of a neighborhood or the city in general through document documented pervasive criminal activity code violations or other causes precipitating the deployment of any city resource um at least the first half of that, I think is pretty good in my mind. Um, and, and to me, in a sense, gets to what we're trying to do with this nuisance property bylaw, which is something that's ongoing, um, mm. an ongoing nuisance, not a one-time nuisance. Um, you know, and so I, I, I guess I'm not sure why, Pam, you thought this was not pertinent to what we're trying to do in this bylaw? Um, I think it's, I think the, uh, if you read it again, it's the, um, some of the violations that we're talking are, about are not specifically health and welfare, unless you're talking about the ability of the neighbor to be able to sleep, um, which is their health. Um, if, I guess what, what's going through my head is that the word substantial disturbance is, is going to be documented by the responder. It's going to be um, confirmed that X and Y is happening. And I think if X and Y is not happening, as I understand it, um, the, the responder will write it up as something but not issue a citation. So so it was enough of a disturbance to get them there to begin with, whether it's somebody seeing seeing it walking by, somebody neighbor having to listen to something or or see it uh, as an ongoing thing. I felt that the that the definition was was just fine. I, I didn't feel the need to be so um, specific, I guess, in in defining it. Um, Pat and then and Mandy. Uh, I'm wondering if we couldn't, instead of substantial disturbance, simply add unreasonable interference of um, of the enjoyment of of. Uh, private or public property and includes is but not limited to bec um, state laws and everything because that the Boston one refers to state laws whether that would leave it open enough I mean uh, I'd be happy with that. that's that's Jennifer, you're nodding, but I can't. Is there something? So I just put my thumb up. I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't see her, so. <laughs> what does the chief think of that? Uh, I like the wording from Boston. That seems to be very applicable. So we'll go with unreasonable interference with the enjoyment of public or private property. 
include, but is not limited to. Everybody okay with that? Andy, you have your hand up still. Yeah, I do because I wanted to now discuss the private part. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, because I, I, I'm trying to find where the uh, attorney, the, com the, the attorney had a comment somewhere that I'm not seeing. The term public nuisance here. Uh... Oh, yeah, uh, here. Got, he yeah. defines a public nuisance as a disturbance of private property. He seemed to question that. Um, I think this is why I liked the Boston one that said interference with a right common to the general public mm. um, and offensive to community moral standards. You know, some of those that that brought it, you know, we have public nuisance in here, but then we're saying it, but isn't if you include private property on it more of a private nuisance um, than a public nuisance? And so I I wanted to rediscuss the inclusion of private property on this um, versus, which is why I like the right common to the general public. Mm. Good thing. Um. So I think I think I understand what the attorney is talking about here. So for example, when we have a we have a noise complaint bylaw, right? So it's not really a noise complaint bylaw. It's more it should be termed more of an unreasonable noise bylaw. So for example, if you have some kind of activity going on um, on the town common where it's maybe unusually loud. That's an acceptable place. It's in a public venue. There's a there's a specific uh, event that's potentially permitted, and that's acceptable. It's a reasonable place because it's in the business district. So that really wouldn't be a violation of our noise bylaw per se. Um, so and that's a public venue. So I kind of understand what the attorney's talking about. You know, public versus a public nuisance versus a private nuisance. I think that's what he's uh, kind of referring to. So, for example, a lot of times we have complaints about uh, the bars being too loud. And that might not necessarily be considered an unreasonable noise because it is in the business district. It is an established uh, uh, business that's uh, conducting their business, which includes noise or music. Um, so it may pertain to that. So that's so that part of it that part of it works. I think um, the so correct me if I'm wrong. The phrase something to the effect of the ability to um, have quiet enjoyment of one's property is something that that is applicable to me or to anyone else who occupies a home and the enjoyment of their private property um is is offended by or impacted by um whatever the disturbance is that's going on so i think it's that phrase the enjoyment of private property it does not mean that joe my neighbor is upset because joe can't enjoy pam's property that's not what we're talking about we're talking about Pam being able to enjoy her property wherever she happened to live um, in that setting. Mandy. So let, let me try a different example. So say I love large artworks that look like trash because <laughs> they're, they're punk steampunk artworks that are 12 feet tall. And I put that and I light it up at night. Well, ignore the lighting at night. I put that in my yard, comply with all the zoning related to it, but my neighbor hates it and determines and says that it's it interferes with his enjoyment of his private property because now he has to stare at my ugly, ugly sculpture. Um, that's not a public nuisance or a nuisance property, yet you could argue under the current definition that says, in, we've changed it to unreasonable interference, but so so that's uh, and maybe it doesn't quite fall under that. But it, someone could argue that Joe, my next door neighbor, could say 
that sculpture substantially disturbs the enjoyment of my property because I can't enjoy my property with this, this mechanical steampunk eight foot tall whirly gig thing that's ugly. Um, but it would not fit under the city of Boston's definition of a right common to the general public because the general public doesn't have a right to like what I put on my property. <laughs> um, and and so I I those those are I think to me that's what the attorney was sort of flagging was private property isn't a public just because you privately don't like looking at someone else's thing or the way they garden think about the not the no mo um um garden movement and the the wildflower front yard garden movement right just because i don't like that look in my yard doesn't mean when you do it in your yard you've created a public nuisance because it disturbs and interferes with the enjoyment of my property um yet the definition that we've kind of got here that the attorney flagged starts to get into that kind of neighborhood dispute personal um opinion matter versus something that is a right common to the general public Jennifer so I would just say how can we raise it or uh, so that that because that's clearly not the intent of why we're creating a nuisance bylaw because we are concerned about artwork in somebody's yard but we're Although I imagine at the point at which your art might fall under obscenity, that that would be, but that's another issue. Um, but we're we're talking about it's usually, you know, because because we're in a college town. I mean, it's usually parties, music, crowds, noise, late at night that keep people awake. I mean, those are what I hear about all the time. So how how do we phrase it? Since this is kind of what really what we're getting to. There should be a, a sort of simpler way, simple way, I would think, to address that. Because that's really the kind of nuisance that is what I'm seems to get reported a lot in in our town because we have a lot of college students that are up late. So we have a list of gosh, probably nearly a dozen different bylaws, whether it's general law, mass general law, zoning bylaws or uh, general bylaws of things that are that are or could constitute a, a nuisance. Um, I just picked out the first half of the Boston one to put it in here so people could read what it might look like. Good. I, I, I don't I don't feel that that many of our of the conditions that we're talking about might be a threat. To the general welfare. Um, they are certainly a major annoyance to the general welfare. No, but 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 the definition includes interference with a right to common common to the general public or a condition dangerous to health, a right general to the common public, which could include a condition dangerous to health or something offensive to community moral standards or something that otherwise threatens the general welfare of a neighborhood or the city, the town in general. It doesn't have to fit all three of those. But it's not limited to activities that could be deemed violation of state and local regulations, such as that defined next in our next yeah. section, which includes everything that we want it to include. Right. I, I left that part in. Yeah, right. Instead of including the Boston second half of it. So I just want to ask Chief Ting if that means that if if someone from your department goes to a a call a disturbance um, that if it's going to be I mean there are a lot of things that are happening that are dangerous to health that's that's true um, the word offensive to community moral standards is I guess would apply to public urination and lewdness and disorderly conduct, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Are there, does this, does this make it 
too strict and and someone from the department says oh we're not going to ticket you because you it's not it's not that offensive it's just bothering the neighbors no i don't think that would uh prevent any of our officers to uh to articulate what they're what they're seeing um you know we we've been dealing with with college students in large scale parties for a long time and we see the same things over and over again uh so we're really well schooled in terms of articulating what we deem as a disturbance and um and usually when we articulate that it's it's pretty clear cut that that it's unreasonable mm -hmm. so i i don't think it would be an issue for us with that terminology does anyone feel strongly that we should not include this portion of the Boston bylaw? Andy, you had your hand up. Oh, sorry. Okay. Anybody? I can't see that my hand is up because of the screen sharing. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody feel, Jennifer? So I just wanted to ask, so we're looking public nuisance, what's in red? Yeah. So I just want to, um, you know, follow up to what the, uh, Chief Ting just said. So because this is sounding like, so would just a noise disturbance from a party that it th that would rise to the level of what's here? I just want to make sure that it's not putting the bar so high that m most of what come under nuisance calls would not rise to that level so i just want to make sure that I, I think i can answer that so so jennifer we do have a specific town town bylaw specific to just noise um there's even okay. a state law which is disturbing the peace so we have other options okay um so nuisance so for us just so you're aware uh nuisance with a noise complaint we have to have a complaint with a nuisance violation we do not so there's kind of that distinction Thank you. Okay. Okay. Anyone feel um, anyone opposed to adding in the wording that's shown in red? Let's move on. Councillor oh, Ette has his hand up. Oops, hold on, Councillor Ette. I just wanted to say that um, it was a unreasonable. If we could change that to an unreasonable. Correct. Grammatically correct. Super. Thank well. you. Okay. Um, I think I think C two looks like it was accepted. Um, I don't know that we need to deal with that. It looks like it's resolved. Anybody have an issue with that? Um, C. This numbering is crazy. C21A, the MGL chapter 272 reference. Uh, is that an issue to some somebody? It just says that the, the, the KP law section says this section of MGL is titled penalty for certain offenses, not disorderly conduct. There is reference to disorderly persons. Should we take out the reference to the Mass General Law? I'm I'm, I'm going to ask Chief Tang. I think what KP is trying to say is that that Mass General Law is specific to disorderly conduct. Um, so there's specific references that you would need to uh, articulate disorderly conduct. So if you just got rid of the Mass General Law, Chapter 272, Section 53, and said something along the lines of disorderly conduct, it doesn't, we're not referencing specific, that specific state law. Um, I think that would probably be more applicable because we're talking about all of these other subsections yep. that kind of fall under it. <clears throat> Uh, just out of out of ignorance, then should we also delete 
reference to the other mass general laws like chapter 138 that, that we have below. I mean, we reference all the way through mm -hmm. uh, is is disorderly conduct an ex uh, an exemption or an exception to that, I mean? Uh, no, if 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 you're asking me, I would have that consistency and probably get rid of all the mass general laws for the sake of consistency. And again, these are criminal offenses that we're talking about, and yeah. nuisance house violation is not. That's a civil citation. <clears throat> Andy, are you having trouble with the the text? No, I'm just curious. Do you want me to re delete the references in the zoning and the generals too? I I, I wasn't. I'm looking to see thing. I wouldn't lean toward deleting them. I don't think there's an issue either way, to be honest with you. If you left it in or if you deleted it, I don't think it would really be that germane to any type of scrutiny. Do people want them left in or taken out? I <clears throat> I think we should leave the uh, zoning ones because it's zoning bylaws are completely wacky. And <laughs> I, I mean, you, Chief, Chief the, you and other people in the department probably know very well what these things mean, but there seems to mm -hmm. be, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just talking for talking sake, I think. No, I agree. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking some of these are really specific. If we change the section references, then they'd be referencing the wrong section almost. And so that's why I was sort of asking, because if we've gotten rid of it in MGL, you know, and, and up here it says um, includes, but is not limited to these activities. And so is referencing the title in some sense and the, the, subject matter good enough without specifically saying a section number in, for future proofing sort of the bylaw in a sense um should they change you mean yeah part of part of me says it would make it easier for somebody who is being um Either handed a citation or being, you know, brought to um, the table for a um, a compliance or a what do we call it, the 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 action plan um, that it's it's easier to say if you have questions you can go read go read these sections. Um, you, lack of knowledge doesn't mean that you're innocent of you know that makes you an innocent. Act, act, actor. Could we leave it in for for now? I mean, just if someone if someone objects strenuously and says it's just not worth having that material, um, it doesn't seem like it is in anybody's way. I don't see any. I don't see anybody raising their hand or saying, <laughs> "Keep it, keep it, or get rid of it." Um, let's see. Where are we? Are we on B specific events? I mean, I personally don't have an issue with it either way, if you're keeping it in or not. I mean, the benefit of it being in there is that somebody can reference the actual um, chapter and section and take a look specifically at that particular law. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that if you don't have it in there, 
they can look it up anyways if they really need to. Um, so for me, it doesn't really make a difference one way or another. Jennifer, you got your hand up. I mean, it just seems like it can't hurt to be there. I mean, it it looks a little, you know, funky, but it, it probably that would just be my feeling. I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, but it, it seems like it couldn't hurt. Let's let's leave it in for now, and we'll move on. Okay. Um, up on B, we have we have specific events or yeah B such as gatherings. Uh, again, this is where we have the word gathering. Does anyone? Um, is it fine as it is? Everyone knows what a gathering in this in this situation is. I think so. Okay, how about C, activities that may not violate a specific law, but that otherwise would disturb the enjoyment of a property? I, I had a question with B, because the attorney um, had this question about, I'm just trying to find it. Um, Whose enjoyment does the public? No, 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 on B, the specific events, the clause Oh, oh sorry. It may include fights, public urination, or litter. Yeah. Um, and so I think at one point there was a question. Oh, it, it, it's resolved here. Is a gathering a violation if underage persons are able to access alcohol regardless of whether there is public urination, fights, or litter? And so it 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 seems interesting, you know, and an odd thing, but but the question I had was, what were we getting at? Did the event have to include alcohol available to minors and fight trash or urination? Or did the event not have to include fight urination or trash? So I, I can see what the attorney was saying and I don't think we've cleared it up, up that issue. If, if I not don't have to include either a fight, public urination, or a litter, we should just get rid of everything after Anne. We cover we cover fights, public urination, or litter up above and above, underneath. Under and seat. underneath, which is why I'm wondering if we should just get rid of this entire phrase. Yes. I agree. Because then it doesn't have that vagueness of, do you have to have both? It is specifically alcohol available to underage persons. Yeah. Good. Okay. I got. I have a quick question in regards to alcohol availability to underage persons. So, when we when we go to some type of disturbance and noise complaint, and there's alcohol around, and there's there's always underage people there. Um, really, there's nothing we can do about that you know, unless we witness them to be in possession of that alcohol. And another thing to consider is, um, and and obviously we would use great discretion in these type of instances, but, you know, especially during graduation parties, you know, families will have alcohol there and they might have siblings or younger people there and they have access to the alcohol. So is that applicable? You know, um, just just food for thought, that's all. And um, or there's other type of birthday parties I've seen where where adults will have uh, they'll have alcohol there present with minors. And so is there a violation there? So I would be careful of that particular usage saying that um, with the potential. So you're you're telling us that if you go to a gathering, uh, mm -hmm. I'll use that word. If you go to a gathering and you see people who look to be underage, A, you really can't do anything about it unless you card them and say, are you, you know, 21? Um, just just their mere presence of uh, being in an area where there's alcohol is not against the law. Right. 
And so there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, but if we if we see them in possession of the alcohol, just merely holding it, they're now in violation, and there's something we can do about that. So we just a say, mere presence is not enough for us. So if we said where alcohol is um, is consumed in, by underage persons in possession of or consumed by, um, and I wouldn't even say consumed because once once. Mm -hmm. Consume. See, this is get off. It gets very technical. You know, even if you're underage and you consume the alcohol, and once it's consumed, it's you're no longer in possession. In other <laughs> states, it's different. So you. So I mean, we're getting into nitty gritty, but. But I mean, somebody will challenge that. So, so if you we just see someone drinking it. <laughs> so that to me is it has to be in possession. So if they're holding it, if we see them drinking it. But if after the fact they've already consumed it, you know, and we didn't see it, then there's nothing we can do about it. So if they're intoxicated, there's nothing we can do about that. We can't prove that. We know that they've had alcohol in their system, but we can't we can't enforce possession of alcohol once it's in their system. <laughs> if you understand that, it's, it gets a little complicated. So if they hear the police come coming, drink it fast. <laughs> or, or drop it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Where there's a will, there's a way. Right. <laughs> oh, dear. So it still gives you... Um, Rob has his hand up. Hi, Rob. Hi. Just have to ask, what if the container's not open? Mm. It's still possession. So okay. as long as they're as long as they're underage, so if they appear to be underage or they're holding alcohol, we can card them, ask them for identification, and it's up to them to prove that they're over twenty one. So it doesn't matter if it's open or not. So open containers that makes it easier for us on a public way, because there's no age limit there. You could be fifty years old and still be in violation of an open container, uh, but on private property, uh, open container does not apply. So we're, we're talking about public nuisance though. So so having an, an unopened container in possession of an underage person constitute a public nuisance. You know, I mean, right. could the language, could the language as, you know, the, the attorney kind of adjusted it a little bit, but could it just say um, available to and being consumed by underage persons? And does that take care of what you were? Not really, Rob, not because we, you know, just the availability of it alone is not enough for us. No, no, it's it says available and being and consumed. It says available and mm -hmm. consumed. So could it? And and what you said is once you've consumed it, it's it may not you know be a violation, but could it be available right. to and being consumed by? Where you're seeing the act of it being consumed. I mean, this is again trying to define what the nuisance is. Uh, you know, a, a, an unopened. Uh, well, tell, container. The, the way that the nuisance house bylaw is written right now for us, and we use this a lot, um, if we if we know there's a party, for example, and we go there and we identify anybody that's in possession of alcohol and they're underage, then it's automatic. It's a nuisance house violation right there. And that's how we utilize that. So hopefully that kind of answers that. So, so you're Chief Ting, you're comfortable with where underage persons possess alcohol is sufficient for your use? I am, yep. Okay. Mandy, you, your hand is up. Do you, you want to weigh in on that? You're muted. Sorry. Um, I'm going back to what the, the very top, which is why I scrolled up, that says a public nuisance includes but is not limited to. And, and then I read this number. A public nuisance includes events where underage persons possess alcohol. Now that uh, uh, underage person possessing alcohol is an automatic, in some sense, state violation of a criminal law but is it automatically a public nuisance? 
good question. You know, and so I go back to, so then I was thinking, you know, none of these are automatically public nuisances per se, um, violations of regulations relating to animals and all. So I wonder if two, where it says a public nuisance includes, but it's not limited to, should actually read may include, but it's not limited to, um, instead of include, sort of that, that mm. possibility one there. And then I go back to particularly B, what about the gathering makes it potentially a nuisance or do we need to define that at all? Um, and maybe we don't if we change two up atop to may include. I like the may include because it gives it a little bit of room. If you know what I mean. Yep. Do you want to add that, Andy? So we also have under number one B is exactly what we just had below possession or consumption of alcohol by an underage person or furnishing alcohol to an underage person, um, which is different than specific events such as gatherings. And I think that's, I think B is trying to address the, the gathering part of the, the concern here. That's, that's sort of the physical. Um... Right. And so does the gathering need to have underage possession, alcohol possession at it? It could be a really loud gathering with no alcohol, but it's unlikely. <laughs> you think? So in that instance, uh, if it, then we would just utilize a noise complaint violation if there's no alcohol involved. There, there have been very few instances where, I mean, a lot of times, you know, it's just loud noise, loud music. Um, so it would just be a noise complaint. So where we would use it as a nuisance house violation is if this is a repeated offense. So let's say we go there two or three times and it's the same infraction. They keep, they, they won't turn the music down. So obviously we would cite them with the noise complaint, but now we can tack on the nuisance house violation. So it's almost a, an additional violation. Um, and that's how we utilize it for that circumstance, whether there's alcohol or not. So if B were to say something like specific events such as disruptive gatherings, Is that I'm I'm looking to somehow maintain the 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 physical volume and and scale of of what's oftentimes are the disturbances. Do we need to even do that? Do we even so if we were to use a word, the word I like to use a lot is unreasonable. Right. And, um. You know, of course that that could be ambiguous, but that's of course again. You know, we would have to articulate what do we deem as unreasonable. Um, and there would be a report that would follow that. Mandy, hand up. Oh, I I can't see that my hand is up, but um, so so I wonder if we can get rid of the where underage persons possess alcohol and do something with, you know, where you said you know unreasonable disturbance or um unreasonable interference or something, but but maybe this is where we can use disturbance. Mm. You know, versus the definition of public nuisance to begin with, that it's these gatherings that cause unreasonable disturbances. Maybe, I guess what I'm saying is, sorry for all the scrolling, that maybe we could, um, specific events or gatherings causing substantial disturbance of the enjoyment or substantial disturbances. Because it all, it, we're trying to further define what a public nuisance is, right? Mm. And so maybe that gathering is where we can use the substantial disturbance language. Yeah, gathering at the top, which is, um, I need to pause just for a second. So it is 736 and we are 
we are on B of a couple more pages. And I I would like to uh, take the temperature of the group. I, I I'm feeling first actually I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll let other people talk first. Pat, should we should we continue on this or should we transition to solar? And I if if we don't transition, I would like to let um, Christine and Stephanie off the hook. I must admit, because I'm also on GOL and I'm working on this and it comes back again to GOL, um, I would like to continue with this uh, and pick up the solar bylaw at our next meeting. But um, I would go with the, you know, the majority of the group. Jennifer? Um, I mean, I would agree it would be nice to finish this. I just, you know, at our next meeting, we'll be doing the planning board interviews. We, we no, may still no, have time. Yeah. Well, there's only three interviews, though, right? Yeah. Fortunately, that's what it's looking like. Yeah. So far. Uh, Councillor Ette, do you have a, um, a feeling about this? Do we continue on, on this topic or switch to solar? I think we should continue striking while the iron is hot. <laughs> Then I am then I'm gonna call that. Um I I agree. And I want to apologize to Stephanie and to Christine Brestrup, who have I think waited uh, on pins and needles waiting for their turn. <laughs> um and I'm looking for I can't find the list of attendees here. There's Janet McGowan is the only person right now, but she would be here for solar. Yeah, so uh, that's probably correct. So I would say then to Janet McGowan, we are apparently not going to do solar tonight. So um, if you want to continue listening to Nuisance Bylaw, you're very welcome to do that. And I'm looking for Christine, but I don't see... I don't see her name in the participants list because I can't find it. No, I'm seeing them on, I think they're panelists now. Okay. I'm here. Here we are. Okay, good. I'm I'm scrolling now. Christine, I I feel bit very badly. Um, but if we if we can keep on this, I thought it would go a little quicker than it is. Mm -hmm. um, we would we would reconvene on solar at our July nine meeting. Yeah. And and the Dave as well to let you know that. So yeah. our our apologies and we'll look forward to seeing you on the ninth of July. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank See you then. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Stephanie. Okay, then we're going to focus on this. Sorry for that interruption. Um, I feel badly we didn't talk about it earlier. Okay, where were we? I've now got I've now got faces in front of the text, so I have to stop. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, move my. my visual bar somewhere else. This is really a thing. Okay. Um, we are at, okay, I have a question. How do I get, how do I get the, the view of the panelists to sit down further on my screen so it doesn't cover up the text? There are four buttons on top. Oh no, you have a different view than me. Never mind. Okay, I'm just gonna do an active. Okay, I got it. I got one active speaker. So if someone wants to say something, you speak and I'll see your face. Okay, we are back to we are back to then B, specific events such as gatherings where underage persons possess alcohol. We do cover underage alcohol up above. 
under 1B, possession or consumption of alcohol, um, do we want this letter B to be the, the gathering? Or do we just want to reiterate that it's uh, an underage possession of alcohol? Mm. Pat. Um, Jennifer has her hand raised. Oh, yes. Okay, I don't see it. You have to you have to say something. So yeah, pops okay. Up. I, I'm sorry. I'm just um my hand is raised because I'm sorry I came late, but I'm going to it. Um, eight fifteen have to sign off. I don't want to interrupt the meeting, so I'm just letting you know that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have a comment on this B, the specific events? Uh, so, I'm Mandy. I I was saying I'm not sure the underage unless we only want events that have underage drinking to be part of sort of what includes a public nuisance. Um, I don't think the underage drinking's the issue here. I think we were trying to more get at large gatherings um, that cause disturbances. Yeah. Um, and so maybe that's where we add, maybe we just say, large gatherings that cause substantial disturbance or something. Or unreasonable disturbance. Or unreasonable disturbance, yeah. Can we say unpermitted gatherings? I'm I'm asking Chief Ting if that helps. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by unpermitted. Um, there is a large party at sunset and uh, at the frat on sunset and mm -hmm. they get a permit um, and they throw a big party with live music mm -hmm. that would be I guess, I guess the reason why I say that is because on private property when is it ever permitted it's never permitted right there's never a permitted gathering so when you say unpermitted then you would <laughs> Somebody okay. would say, okay, well, what's a permitted one then? Okay, okay. Good, good cause. Jennifer, I thought I saw your hand up. It was, it was about that. Um, but I don't want to take up time with that here. So keep going. So now we have the word gatherings and we took out gatherings from. And I think we, I think people know what that is. You know, a gathering can be two people, could be ten people. All right, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I, I think I know oh. what again. Okay, <laughs> that's good, good. Okay, that cause unreasonable disturbance. That's great. Um, C, activities that may not violate. We have. Do we need this here, given the other? Uh, let's ask Chief Ting yeah, because yeah. these are very specific items that they can now ticket for. Which which item are we looking at? Sorry, this is C activities that may not violate a bylaw or regulation, but otherwise disturb the enjoyment of a property, including public urination, fights, blocking of public way due to gatherings excessive litter or refuse on the property visible from the public way. Mm -hmm. Are these items that we need to specifically mention because they are not specifically mentioned um, in any of the general laws, zoning bylaws or general bylaws? I guess I guess I would question why we would need to specifically identify those you know yeah. there was earlier on there was a passage from from boston that specifically stated um i, I don't i'm paraphrasing something uh against morality and mm -hmm. uh, you know so that could be anything it, it i don't think we would necessarily have to specify because again when we document a violation we talk about these things that uh, there's beer cans all over the place. There's litter. 
there's garbage, there's uh, people urinating in the neighbor's bushes. And all of those things are against uh, general morality. Um, and those are in the description. So I don't know if we would need to specifically indicate because there's probably, I could probably think of another dozen more to throw in there. And do we need to specify every single one? Um, I, I don't think we need to. I wonder if um, up under B, uh, where we have gatherings that cause unreasonable disturbance, could we add in and may block, may block the and may block the public way? Would that would that sort of include that aspect of it? Because I I think, again, I think about sunset was, from what I understand, pretty harrowing because the because the um, rescue vehicles couldn't get through. Yeah, I mean, I like that, but like I said, you know, I, I don't know if we would need to specifically um, cite that as an as an instance, because everybody knows if a public way is blocked, that's against the law. Okay. Um, we may you know, know I, people partying may not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just like, I like, I like the generality of anything that's unreasonable and anything that, that violates the morality of, of any, um, However, it's worded in that uh, that earlier paragraph, and mm -hmm. I think that encompasses everything. Okay, so anyone feel uncomfortable about taking out uh, element C with the four? Um, what about the excessive litter? Because that is a huge issue. Do we cover it anywhere else? Is the part so I, I think it could be covered as as Chief Ting was saying in the general definition of public nuisance up at the top in definitions where we talk about hazards to health. Okay, I'm I'm good with that if that in fact can be referred to there. Okay. So now we get to designation, nuisance property. And this, I think, Aunt Mandy, is where we talked about infraction versus violation. Yep, working on changing them as we come across them. Okay. That seems to read okay. Uh, F is persons liable, jointly and several, severally liable. Um, can somebody remind me why number one was crossed out? So the attorney recommended crossing out number one and removing the, the di distinction between of when a owner or a person in charge becomes liable. And I'm curious whether GOL talked about that removal because that changes the operation of the bylaw completely by making the owner of the property, if the owner is not the person causing the nuisance, liable immediately, not after the third, after the second one on the third one. But that's that was an attorney change. Right. Can I, is this also the one, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, is Councilor Haneke finished? Yeah, I am. Okay. Was this the one where there seemed to be a concern that if it was a duplex or triplex and the party was happening in one unit, that you distinguish that it would only be the unit that was having the party? Because I, I, I thought I remembered reading that the attorney said you were just saying residents of the property, so it may not include. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that here? Is this part of that? Yeah. Okay. That that's that's this a that's this. and this comment here. So I mean I'm okay with removing the the 
sort of tiering of it, but then there's a lot of changes, I believe, that um, need done later to make it consistent. Yet at the same time, if we remove it and don't tier, I think owners of properties that they rent will have a big problem with getting a ticket without any due process. I wonder if there is some due process notice issues there too, when they didn't have any, you know, similar to what Jennifer just said about the multifamily dwellings. Well, the owner might not have been involved at all either and didn't get any warning that they could have a ticket. I agree. I think the the point that we were trying to make is that it is not an immediate reaction. It is on the, there is notification on the first and second, the first or second infraction in a one year period was a really important factor. Um, and the first and second, you have the occupants notified, you have the person who organized and the persons engaging, should they in fact be, um, ticketed, right? Um, to me, that's a really important distinction that the certainly the owners and managers would look for. I guess and I feel we shouldn't take the attorney's recommendations in this section, at least as to the deleting of the tiering. I agree. Anybody else agree? I agree. I'm okay with that. Councilor Ette? He, he can I'm fine. That. I'm <laughs> fine with that. It's going to show up at GOL, and if that is a question, then that would be raised there. Because because some things don't kick in until the third violation, and um, yeah, I I think it's important that we keep that. So A, B, and C refer to that first violation, or for the for number one. Mandy, thank you, by the way, for editing. So as she has it set up now, the new number two is for a property receiving the third or greater infraction in a one year period and having, oops. No, no, I'm, I'm just trying to format it, sorry. Give me a second. better. Okay, so let's go through it. E, persons liable. The following shall be jointly and severally liable. We get the property receiving first or second infraction. And then we have A, the occupants, B, the persons who organized, C, persons engaging. Number two, I believe, should be for property receiving the third or greater infraction, having been notified of the first and second infractions. Again, the occupants, again, the person to organize, and again, the persons engaging. And, and then, the persons in charge. Lastly, the persons in charge, correct. Um, there were other questions on this. The occupants is defined up at the top, I believe, in our definition. 
Well, it is not. Oh, it's not. Okay. <clears throat> but does someone not know who an occupant is? Yeah, so, but I think the issue is if it's um that's that's the go ahead. The double dwelling, the the right. duplex or or occupants at the property, right? Not not at the dwelling. Maybe we need to say dwelling, not property, because in an apartment complex, it's everyone that lives in the complex because it's one property. Or unit, yes. dwelling unit. Right, because I, I was looking at the, the definition of property, all lands, including all structures, improvements and fixtures thereon, and property of any nature, so that, yeah, that includes the whole Puffton Village, if you will. Uh, I'm going to ask Chief Ting or and or uh, Rob Mora about uh, this definition in terms of um, spelling this out. Okay, which uh, which section are you so specifically? We're, right now we're we're talking about um, a property who is liable, and mm. have the word for a property receiving the first or second violation notice. Um, the following are responsible: the occupants at mm -hmm. the dwelling unit, at the dwelling unit where the nuisance took place, the persons mm -hmm. organized, and then persons engaging. But I guess I oh sorry I guess my my question for the terminology if we're going to talk about um, defining occupants so we usually go by residences residents people who are who live there um, because an occupant could potentially just be a party guest so are they responsible for the nuisance. Um, and I suppose if we're going to say the occupants I personally think that. Even if you are a guest, you can also be held responsible for your actions, whether you're a guest or a resident, even though in general, what we will do is we issue the violation to the residents because we can establish that they live at the household, they're hosting the, the gathering, and their the actions of their guests are ultimately their responsibility because they are the host. Um, but that doesn't mean that we cannot issue any type of violation for the party guests, which we would consider an occupant because they are there occupying the space and creating that disturbance. So should we under E for persons liable, it's at the very top of the screen, persons liable, should it be for a resident receiving the first or second notice? And the occupants at the at the residence for the public nuisance took place that, i would that... think that would make sense simply because if we are going with a third offense to uh to be issued to um a the owner of the property then i think their domain falls under the residences to me that makes sense any other thoughts on that um i have a couple Sure. I would keep it at property. Um, mm. if, if you've got three units on a property or eight units on a property and there's a violation that's issued to apartment one, three months later, it's apartment two. And three months later after that, it's apartment three. I think we want to bring the owner of the property in, even though it was three different units. Um, and so I would keep the notices and the persons liable for property um, there. But the attorney said that A, the occupants, um, we had it at the property, the occupants could probably be deleted um, because he believed it was sufficient to include organizers and those enga engaging along with persons in charge. So he believed it was sufficient to essentially say B and C the people who organized the activity that resulted in the nuisance and those that engaged in it mm. is in, essentially includes everyone else. And then it gets rid of this 
this issue about um, multiple multiple dwell family multifamily dwellings that A mm. causes. So I would actually suggest we delete A from each one because it it's problematic, and B and C are getting to who we actually want to, and then at the third in violation, we we've got the persons in charge. Um, which should also probably have the owner in it, the owner and persons in mm -hmm. charge of the nuisance property. Um, but but we add that in. I don't think we need A in either of these instances, given what the attorney said and the concerns the attorney had. So I'm gonna. I I think I agree with that. Um, but I but I'm also aware of the fact that they want us. Somebody wanted us to post at the property or post at the at the residence. Um, if if we aren't tagging the occupants of that residence or that dwelling unit, do we have somebody to post to? Do you think the persons organizing or sponsoring are the same as, I think in your in your words, they're the same as the occupants? I mean, it would be very strange if the org, if we're talking about a party, which is I think for these instances we are, because if it's if it's something else, we might not be. It would be very strange for someone to organize a party at someone else's house. True. <laughs> um, I mean, it could happen, I guess, um, with high school students, maybe. Um, <laughs> but, um, um, you know, I I guess I, I'd go with what the attorney said and just delete A. And deal with the posting when we get there later. Okay. Anybody else uh, uh, object to that? And Mandy, it's it's eight oh three. Just so you're aware. I am. Jennifer has her hand raised. Jennifer, I can't see it. Sorry. Um, no, I just want to say I I agree with Councillor Haneke that if it's a multi-unit or an apartment complex that the owner should be notified if there are three violations, even if it's at different units. I don't know if that has to be specified. But the other thing, if I was a property owner and I lived off site, I would want to know that even at the first, I mean, is there a way just for the owner to be notified that a nuisance that, violation that's, occurred? That's later in the bylaw. Yeah, okay. I, I thought later. it was. Yeah. But, yeah, we asked to have them notified. Okay, so you're striking A. Um, owners and persons of charge provided. Yes, okay. So I think we can move on. We're on F. Or, yeah, enforcement and penalties. Response costs. Uh, I think the town, the 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 attorney said something about. Um, let's read what the attorney says. Um, it says, in my opinion, the town, for example, could not seek reimbursement for the police response to an underage party with alcohol. Moreover, it may be difficult to calculate the response cost based on the so-called Emerson test. I don't know what Emerson test is, but I think the word may, it doesn't say we have to. And in fact, we rarely do. Note that to the extent that a property is a nuisance because of trash or junk, it's common for towns to seek reimbursement for those abatement costs. However, that authority is typically found under other state laws and regs like sanitary code. We'll need further information on the intent of this, including any draft fee schedule for payment of response costs. Uh, Chief Ting, do you have any comment about this? Just what are the response costs? Um, no, because we've never gone after reimbursement in that sense. Do we feel a need for this? It's, it's going to burn. 
I guess it's sort of a red flag that um, again, for repeat repeat offenders who who you know after the several times really ought to be starting to get um, some some monetary penalty for having. So I, you know, I find it difficult. The so number three response costs. So the the town may seek reimbursement for administrative costs and response costs. So if I think it's setting a bad precedence because if we're asking for response costs in that sense, then then we can ask for a reimbursement for any type of call that we have to respond to multiple times. Um, I would eliminate number three. I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's something we can actually do. Um, yeah, I just I, we've never gone after anybody for response costs uh, for anything, and okay. I don't know if we could legally do that. I don't know if Rob Rob is still with us. Rob, does this uh, if we take this out, does this affect anything that the um, rental registration or response costs for any of the inspection services might, like if it's inspection services for the junked cars, is does this take away your ability to tag that owner for cost? No, it does not. We have other regulations that uh, in some cases would uh, allow that to happen. And we would use those regulations, such as the uh, state sanitary code. Okay. Okay, good. So everybody comfortable with taking this out? Yes. Uh, Councilor Haneke has her hand up. Oh, I am. Um, I just need to leave, but I'm the one sharing the screen and all. Okay. So I'm going to have to unshare and stop. Okay, I'm going to make sure that I... Um... Uh, that I have and I did have a lot of comments on the next couple sections, but I apologize that I have to go. Okay, so let me just make sure that I can find the the uh, document. Which one are you using? The one that we um, is my own. Have... I have my own local copy. I was using of okay. the downloaded packet document. Would you so I downloaded the document and it's just on my computer right now? Okay, can you email that to me? I can. If that is not too, so it's eight oh nine. We've got we've got a bit more to go. And it will float to the top of my fifty four unread town emails. Have the interview questions been decided and all? They were voted back in May. Oh, okay. Because you had you had stuff on that on the agenda. Yeah, I was just going to go through and see if we could divvy them up by, you know, in order or something like that. I think we could do that the night of as easily. Or well, last time I sent something out and just did it in alphabetical order. There you go. I'll yeah. send that to you. Okay. I'll send that to Great. everyone. I'm not seeing it yet, Mandy. I, I was just saving it. I haven't sent it yet. I'm working on it. I'm sitting here going, am I missing it? No. But I, I don't know how to get you my comments. On Can you get them to GOL? Um, no. I don't... I mean, I could, but GOL sent it back to CRC. Yeah, yeah it so, seems to me. Well, well, Mandy's still here, and we'll try to be brief with it. But um, so you have specific comments that haven't been discussed tonight, or have we incorporated your comments and addressed those things? Uh, not in the sections we haven't gotten to. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it may then... If you were to send those to me, I'm not sure we adequately will address it. Jennifer. So if the 
could we, after the interviews, if we if we don't have that many candidates and the deliberations don't take as long, maybe we could do it at the next meeting. We could you know, uh, go to the sections where Councillor Haneke um, has, has comments. I mean, I would appreciate that, but I, I do have to leave, so. <laughs> So we really have just section G notification oh. and, and correction left. Yeah, and I think Jennifer has to leave in like two minutes too. Okay, so so I'm gonna make a an executive decision. Um Mandy, if you would please send me that anyway. We'll have all I the emailed the one I was working on, not my own copy, but the one that we were modifying should be in your email now. Okay, great. And we will reconvene this. And I really appreciate um, Building Commissioner and Chief Ting for um, sticking with us. And I guess it, uh, we'll take a look at the 25th as a possible date for finishing this up. Really appreciate your time. And um, we'll, we'll cut out a little early tonight. Does anybody object to that? No. <laughs> Shake your head. No, I see no. I'm leaving. I see no nodding. Jennifer has to leave. Um, uh, I'm I, sorry. Uh, I'm going to take a vote to uh, adjourn. Pat. It was a yes. Pam, yes. Okay. We're adjourning. You vote yes. It's talking to me. And Jennifer. Yes. I can't hear Councillor Ette. I can't hear your response. Oh, yes. Good. Okay. So we have adjourned the meeting. Thank you, everybody. And um, we'll take it up again. Really appreciate your time. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank Bye, you. Bye-bye. Thank you. And David.